Hello, everyone. Hi. We are part of the Schools for Future Youth team. So I'm Nikki Morgan. I'm working with Oxfam GB, managing some of our international education projects across Europe um, and internationally. And these are my colleagues. We've got Fede, John, and Claudia. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Federica. I work for Oxfam Italy as Senior Education Officer. Hi, I'm John McLaverty. I work for Oxfam GB. I'm the Education and Youth Advisor. I'm Claudia and I am a project manager for School for Future Youth and a trainer. So we're going to turn off our video now, but we really wanted to say a quick hello to you all in person. Um, I will be taking you through the first session, which is just looking at the aims and objectives of Schools for Future Youth. And then I'll talk you through a little bit more what you'll be expecting in the next hour. We've got Claudia hot on the chat button. So any questions or problems that you're having, please write to us um, and Claudia will get back to you. Thank you. So I'm sure many of you have already heard me talking about SF Youth, Schools for Future Youth. Um, and we are a team not just of Oxfam Italy and Oxfam GB. We are working with other partners across Europe. We're working with um, Cardet, which is an organization in Cyprus focusing very much on technology and education. And we are all sat here together in Cyprus in a meeting room because we're all here for another European project called Future Youth Schools Forums, um, working with a big group of 20 teachers this week. So we thought we'd take the opportunity as we're all together to share this project, Schools for Future Youth, with you. So there's Oxfam Italy, Oxfam GB, Cardet in Cyprus, and then we work with a small NGO in Poland called Polish Humanitarian Action. Um, the uh, name really gives away the focus of the organization. They do work a lot with humanitarian relief. Um, and we work with the Institute of Education at the University College London in Europe. University College London in the UK who have been doing a lot of the research um, and the analysis and they'll be looking at policy recommendations coming out of this project. So what is Schools for Future Youth? So at the moment across Europe there is a need to increase educational achievement and active participation of young people in their community. So one way that we as partners thought this would could be achieved was through youth participation and global citizenship and applying this within a school setting. So this project is funded by the European Union um, in a stream called Erasmus Plus and we were looking specifically at schools but a lot of the tools that you'll see that have come out of this project we think um, can actually be implemented outside of a school's curriculum and can be used in informal youth work as well so there's a lot of tools that we think will be really useful for you all as well. So through our own experience collectively as partners we identified that we wanted to look at youth participation and global citizenship in two different areas, both through a school's curriculum um, and also through um, informal education. So working in schools groups within a school setting, but outside of the classroom time. And we wanted to develop resources to inspire teachers and young people to actively contribute to shaping a fairer and more socially just world. And John and Fede are going to be talking you through exactly what that means and the types of resources that we wanted to provide teachers and young people to use as part of this project. So our main objectives really as part of this project was to develop the resources, so actual learning materials that teachers could be using to support global citizenship education in their schools. We also wanted to develop tools for young people, so something that they could use, quizzes, interactive materials, an app to help them develop their own knowledge of global issues, and then also to take action. So we're going to talk about a learn, think, act model later on in this presentation as well. And then broader than this, we wanted to influence school systems across Europe to try and take this approach more broadly and really focus on the positive outcomes for young people that global citizenship education can bring. So some of the main um, highlights really, so why did we think teachers and youth workers um, should actually be using Schools for Future Youth? Why is it important? We believe these resources and this approach can make a curriculum more engaging for young people. And we've heard that through anecdotal feedback from young people themselves during focus groups that we've conducted. 
We really wanted to put young people more at the heart of teaching approaches across Europe. And we wanted to bring this idea of civic engagement into the classroom, so real benefits for teachers. So for young people, we really wanted to develop their critical thinking skills, getting them thinking beyond putting a hand up and answering a question, developing their own opinions. We wanted to develop their participation skills, so getting them active in their local community and in their schools, and be more motivated generally to take civic actions. And we've seen that throughout all of the partner countries where we've had schools and young people involved. They've been really motivated to actually go on and take action. And then it was important for us to also look at the school system and school leaders. And we had a network of schools that came on board as a trial for this project. We had four leading schools. And then in each country, we had 10 trial schools. So we had a network of about 40, 45 schools acro across Europe using our resources. And to sell this, this project, these resources to those school leaders, it was really about developing staff, their engagement and their motivation, and um, supporting their young people and developing specific skills within their school, and also supporting the school ethos. So as we go through the resources that are available, hopefully you'll see that we're trying to tick some of those boxes. And ultimately, we wanted to try and start building a European network of young people inspired, motivated, and ready to take action on issues that are relevant to them with the ability to make local and global connections. So this webinar will be looking at global citizenship education and why we decided to focus on that. John will be talking you through that. We'll be looking at Oxfam's campaigns and linking to um, issues that Oxfam cares about, so looking specifically at rights in crisis and refugees, and Fede will touch on that. And then we're going to take you on a journey through the platform. Um, we call this a toolbox. It's a real kit of resources for teachers and for young people. So we'll be showing you the website and getting you to investigate yourself and give us some feedback. So any questions you have, keep writing them in the box, and we'll pick them up as we go along. John, over to you. OK, good afternoon again, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about global citizenship education and how the project and um, its outcomes fit in with the formal education system. Um, I'm going to speak from UK experience, but I don't think the um, experience in other countries has been um, radically different. So our approach at Oxfam GB with, um, with young people is that, well, all young people are in school. That's where you find uh, young people. We have 8 million of them under 16 years old in the UK, and they are in 20,000 schools. So if we wish to reach young people, school is the place to go. And the people who are our potential allies and multipliers are the teachers who work in schools. So if we can reach teachers with compelling and relevant resources and materials, then we can reach um, young people far more effectively than if we attempt to do that um, ourselves. So we've used a methodology called Global Citizenship Education, which I'm sure you're aware about, and I hope that Claudia is going to put the link to the relevant Oxfam document up on the screen. Um, within this approach, we break down of education into five different sections. And we call this approach KUVAS, K-U-V-A-S, with the K and the U standing for knowledge and understanding, the V and the A, for values and attitudes, and the S for skills. So clearly every school, whether it's interested in active global citizenship or not particularly interested, employs KUVAS. Schools teach knowledge and understanding of something. It might be a, the different subjects, the different curricula. Schools also have values and attitudes. For example, think of the motto that schools have, you know, such as serve society or whatever. And then sc schools also um, develop skills in young people, whether that's civic engagement skills or whether that's mathematical equation skills, they develop skills. 
So I think our challenge in the project and in the broader work we do is to identify the overlaps that exist in schools between the, the Kuvas of the school and the Kuvas that Oxfam wishes to develop in young people as active citizens and youth campaigners. So the, the project resource writing and the materials that we took into schools were trying to identify the win-wins and the overlaps between what the school would deliver within its formal curriculum and what um, young people could develop as active citizens and youth who were engaged in civic participation um, and so forth. Um, doing this, we had a number of um, both, I think, challenges and opportunities. And, and I think there are, are three main ones. The first one is the whole issue within education of soft skills and competencies. And in that respect, you know, I'm talking about things like leadership, teamwork, and young people's voice. Um, these are the sorts of skills which are very often not developed through the formal curriculum, which schools wish to develop, and which active citizenship proposes to develop. So that's the first. The second is skills for employability, which very often um, relate to the same types of soft skills and competencies, where, um, <clears throat> excuse me, where very often young people are felt not to be developing those skills adequately through the formal curriculum. And then the final um, sort of opportunity is the motivation and engagement of young people, where active citizenship and civic engagement actually enable them to become more motivated and engaged um, in the life in the school. So that's basically the, the framework and the opportunity that, that exists between the um, global citizenship proposal that we were making and the existing curricula of the schools that we were working with. So I think that's enough theoretical explanation. Fede, can you now begin maybe to take us through yeah. some pages on the website and to show us to do, the resources? The... Okay. Yes. Here we are. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot, John. Um, when we talk about exploring the different issues that we have been uh, working with young people, let me just find the right page for you. Um, here are the issues that we have been identifying since the beginning of the projects. The first issues that we have been focusing on have been uh, food climate change, and um, education at the very beginning and then we have been adding new uh, topics according to Oxfam's global campaigns. It is um, nice to share that uh, um, within the partnership we had different tasks to deal with and so Oxfam Italy was in charge to develop the education materials for teachers, whereas uh, Oxfam GB was in charge to develop the education materials for young people. But uh, as John is an ex-teacher and I am an ex-youth worker, or still a youth worker actually also in Oxfam, um, we have been uh, collaborating a lot at the beginning, it was a kind of, uh, it seems like that we were speaking a bit two different languages, that is, we do actually in practice. But in the very end, we nowadays were really, the, the four of us, really working as a team. And uh, it's very easy and straightforward to find connections and to make, to create meaningful resources for all the ones that we want to tackle, taking into consideration that. Uh, the nice description that John just made for you about uh, 
the British education system, it doesn't really apply to the Italian one in most of the cases. So this has been a bit of a challenge. Another challenge that we have been coping with together was that uh, um, the curricular systems are very different. So for instance, in the UK, the high school lasts until when students are 8, 16 years old, whereas in Italy, high schools starts when students are 14 and finish when they're almost 19. But thanks to the fact that uh, global issues somehow are not really um, tackled as we would like to, so young people in general might not have an in-depth idea about what are the main connections that we can find. Uh, and also to the fact that we have been uh, trying to balance formal and non-formal education uh, proposals in the pedagogical approach. This allowed us to somehow standardize and to have a margin in order to make those activities oper operational also for different target groups. Mm -hmm. So some, some of the activities, most of the activities that uh, we are now going to explore have been tested with over 18 years old, with uh, asylum seekers in Italy, and also with um, several mixed groups coming from different uh, experiences. So um, I'm going to present to you the, uh, the activity, well, maybe it's easier if I open it from here, uh, the activity related on refugees as uh, I think it's mainly Oxfam staff participating in this webinar, you might know that in Italy we do have a, um, an office that is working with the reception of asylum seekers and we do host asylum seekers in uh, Sicily and in Tuscany. Therefore, for us it was really a huge priority to tackle these issues, to be able to communicate about these issues to our young people and to start to put in practice somehow of some kind of integrational uh, proposals that would facilitate also the coexistence of people with very different backgrounds and uh, to give the opportunity to um, uh, people with migratory background also to um, try to integrate, or at least these activities have been useful to prepare young people then to meet actual asylum seekers in person. Um, all the resources that we have been uh, produced and then uh, we have just updated according to the SDGs framework. So that's why we're uh, having this webinar right now because uh, the, web the website has been uh, just uh, newly released and newly updated and all the activities proposed are uh, um, framed according to the SDGs priorities. Um, we always have tried to merge uh, different kind of medias to work with young people in order to tackle different kind of intelligence that young people can have. So at the beginning you find a short explanation, there's always a kind of videos. Most of the videos that we have, the videos and the pictures that we have been using have been taken from Oxfam's Word and Pictures resources that uh, personally I didn't know uh, about the existence of uh, words and pictures since when, uh, until when John told me, but you have a lot of pictures for, from Oxfam uh, um, portals. And uh, a new stage of my working life experience show, opened up somehow. Um, we try to bring a kind of um, information because as uh, John was saying before we work through the learn think and act uh, approach and when we talk about learn we want to provide uh, like source of information in to allow young people to make up their own minds and to get their own opinion about what's the issues that we want to tackle with them and uh, in the bluish words, you can see these are all hyperlinks so that young people can further explore. And we always try to raise some questions for young people because this part of the website, it's uh, all available also for um, Android app. 
So it's a downloadable, a downloadable app because the, we believe that this part could be undertaken both in a group, in a class, but also a person by himself, herself, can easily start the quiz. And just to start, you know, just to make it fun. Uh, let's make a trial. Select the correct answers to this statement. A refugee, someone who has, who has left his country of nationality because what's, what's your bet? What? And type the answer, please. Yeah. Answer A is they are at risk of at risk of persecution for membership of a particular social group or political opinion. B, they are not happy with their wages. They can't buy a new mobile for phone or have holidays. C is they have a well-founded fear for not returning to their country. D, they are at risk, of, at risk of persecution for reasons of their race, religions, and or nationality. Claudia, do we have any answers? Not yet. I would encourage our guests to give an answer. Someone is, is writing, Erica, Paul, Paul says A and Erica says D and Carolina says A. Okay. Do you want to? What? What? What's? Yes, please. What's the majority then? It's A. A. Mm -hmm. Let's see if you're right. Mm. And you are. Correct answer A, C, and D, because at the beginning we tried to be fair with uh, participating people to our quizzes. And then you get all the explanations, and now I'm not going to read it all, but you know, you get the explanations with the resources, with the sources of information, the UN, um, uh, UN uh, resolutions, and so on. And then you can continue. Anyway, the winner is Paul because he said A, C, and D. So wow, <laughs> proficiency answers. <laughs> and then you can start, you can continue. And so these quizzes are all for all the topics that we have been tackling uh, under the uh, the previous page that I showed you, the Exploring Global Issues page. So we are not going to have all of them, but. After every answer, you get the correct answers and the explanation, and then in the end, you get your final score. And after a while, you might decide that if you didn't get a very good score, that you want to retake again, and you can compare the scores that you had before at the beginning with the scores that then you made at the end, you know, to see if uh, going through the different parts, you have been learning something new. Then, this is to to work on the learn part of the pedagogical approach. Then we have the think part. So think critically about refugees. And it opens up another new world of information. <clears throat> and here again, you get a lot of inputs. So there's an, an outline with an explanation. It explains what are the learning objectives and the resources. So this part is more let's say it can it can be undertaken autonomously but it's more to working group somehow you know to have uh, someone guiding a bit the the discussion it could be also a peer um, uh, a peer group you know sharing but it's nice because in uh, in the activity there's the outline that sets and focus a bit the idea of uh, the content then you get the learning objectives and the resource keywords that we want to tackle, and the list of the source of data in order for uh, the facilitator, the teachers, on whoever, to be able then to look back and refer to those resources. So teachers note who is a refugee, and there's a lot of explanation on uh, the refugees, the United Nations, and uh, some <clears throat> tasks to be undertaken by the group. And so like, for instance, these are uh, cards that can be downloaded and uh, you can match the blue parts with the white parts, you know, and to it's another way to let young people in a more um, physical way to try to merge the two parts uh, and to find out the different matches together. And um, 
where do the refugees come from and where do they go? And here we have again other uh, proposal for activities to, to work together. And then it's to work in small groups and then to come back in plenary in order to have a debriefing. And uh, obviously in the end, we also try to provide some more data, so about who is a refugee in detail and uh, where do the refugees come from and where they go because there's a lot of uh, um, media misinformation uh, that is a bit um, an um, anachronistic way to say to do things to put the two things together but uh, uh, especially in Europe there's a lot of perceptions that uh, they are all coming to Europe and then if you look at the data only two zero two percent of asylum seekers are coming to Europe and that's something that also we always try to uh, let young people focus on and um, and here again, this is another part that can be done either just reading or just uh, uh, facilitated by someone as uh, in a gamini gamification uh, style. Um, going back to the previous page, which is a bit of a challenge somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. no. Not this one, just a second. Uh, refugees. Here you go. Then there's the take action part, and <clears throat> and here again, we try to narrow even more. You know, and going into in depth. Also, these act these resources has been implemented last year in between of the Balkanic route and the closing of the Balkanic route and uh, the the enhancement of the route through Italy. So we were always, you know, by the time that we were writing part of the resources, they were already uh, not updated anymore. So we were always running after information, being aware that whatever we would have written, uh, it would have been uh, the updated version for the ones coming afterwards. But we settled it in 2015 as a way, you know, to bring a lens of what was happening in that specific moment. Um, and so there's here the introduction, what is happening now, what needs to change, and what can you do? And we always propose as a wider approach, a general approach to inform. So to inform peers, families, communities, or uh, on, on social media about what is happening, to broadcast. So to get creative and raise awareness in your school and community. And we had very, very good examples of uh, young people like uh, doing flash mobs in uh, Expo Milan in 2015 or other people doing like uh, um, bicycle um, demonstrations in Poland or in England uh, running or giving, sending petitions to MPs. And so uh, several diff different uh, up kind of approaches, you know, to be active and to show off and then try to inflate. So, you know, always trying to influence these decision makers towards what it can be done and how it can be done. And here a deeper explanation on uh, with some ideas on how these could be put in place. <clears throat> And then I try to be rapidly because this website has a l really a huge amount of information on it and we would like to give you a general review about all the different opportunities that can be done. And uh, beyond that, <clears throat> as, I, as I was saying at the beginning, this part was meant to be done for also young people to be able to work as, uh, in peer groups and from the um, mobile smartphone app. Whereas we also have been developing these class resources with uh, an overview that again uh, focus and explain and provide a focus about what is happening <clears throat> on that specific uh, topic. And the presentation and scripts, that is a PowerPoint presentation, that is obviously everything is downloadable on this website. Uh, it's a PowerPoint presentation that uh, teachers or uh, trainers or facilitators can work can use as guiding lines you know to go through a workshop i just opened the workshop i won't go up, um, through all the different parts i don't know how long did it take so far um, mm -hmm. 
and so the um, the workshops is uh, um, inspired from a European project that I think that several Oxfam, European Oxfam have been working on, on a wonderful website that even unfortunately is not online anymore, but uh, I've been trying to um, get inspired when uh, making some proposals. And it was like the Land of Invisible um, IU program on um, um, raising awareness in European uh, citizens about the reasons why refugees and a lot of and people were moving towards Europe, let's say. And here again, as it was for the other part, we always have this uh, um, outline, learning objectives, outcomes, resources. So the materials that you need in order to be able to run the activity, and then what to do before the broad workshops, how to prepare the workshops, and how to use the presentation so that the, present, the PowerPoint presentations with a, not personally really a fan of, but in some cases they can be useful, are like references that throughout the hour, two hour of uh, activity that you're going to run with the young people, you can use as reference in order to launch um, in order to launch also uh, group activities in between. And so here there's all an explanation uh, about uh, how to use each slide and on each slide there's a, uh, an import link on uh, um, YouTube uh, videos, some from Oxfam, others from uh, other resources at the international level. And that's, uh, that's a way also that uh, it can be very useful to, to work with young people. Then there's another activity that is a non-formal education activity. So that's something that is, is, is not uh, like brand new, but like uh, the sweet case. And what would you take if you can bring only a few items with you to, during a journey? And what would you do if those items would be um, We'll have to, would have to be less and less and less. And what so to let young people understand that um, by, by leaving physically the place where you're from, you are leaving also all the, uh, the things, not the things, but also the things that represent your affections, let's say. And uh, for these particular activities, we're still developing also role play, that it's, uh, it's a part of a big, big uh, challenge and that we are still tackling. And um, I don't know if you have any question about this specific part, otherwise I would uh, propose to move on. Yes, please, Nikki. So I really wanted to add, um, refugees as an issue, rights and crisis, people forced to flee was a real issue for Oxfam as an organisation and being two out of the five partners are Oxfam, Oxfam Italy and Oxfam GB are sitting here, we did have quite a lot of weight within our partnership and consortium to actually bring issues that are really relevant to Oxfam's campaign to our Schools for Future Youth project. Um, working with PAH in Poland, um, looking at a lot of humanitarian aid, we brought in their expertise. Um, and working in Cyprus, they were sort of really the technical developers. So we were able to use this project to link to Oxfam's campaigns and resources and have a bit of a win-win for the project. So we're deliver delivering against our European aims and objectives, but we're also delivering for Oxfam as an organization. We're delivering on our goals and we're trying to access and, and reach a different kind of audience than our rights in crisis campaign in the UK, for instance, may be reaching. So in this way, we're trying to bring young people into the mix for Oxfam's campaigns and say young people can actually work on this issue, they can learn about it and they can take action in a way that isn't signing a petition um, or making their vote count. So we were looking at that specifically around refugees, which is why we wanted to show you that issue today. Okay, thank, thanks a lot. And so... I would suggest now to start a bit of a journey within this uh, website. And therefore, I would like to show you... Yeah. No, it doesn't work here. 
So the website is composed of many different components. We are just being seeing the part about exploring global issues, but then we cannot expect to have young people um, claiming human rights or with a global citizenship education approach, taking for granted that they have all the skills in order to do so. So I would like to invite John. That's the skill development section. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, let's see, because these are one of those parts of the website that uh, having uh, me and John complementary competencies, we have been developing um, according to the different uh, topics, let's say, together. Um, we would like to ask you to pick one of those uh, skills, and then we can show you the structure. Yes. Uh, Lisa says that they cannot see the screen. So, is everybody having this problem? So, on the screen, we can just run through some of the skills that you can see. So, we have advocacy and leadership, we have critical thinking, we have deciding actions, evaluating actions finding information, planning actions, uh, sorry, um, public speaking, running a meeting, sharing responsibilities, skills for action, taking decisions, using social media, using your voice, working together and writing for others. So that's 15 on my latest count, different actions. Um, and John, maybe you could just explain a little bit how they're set up and our idea for them, just in case people can't see. Yeah, sure. So, at, at the earlier on, when we were speaking about Kuvas, we talked about Kuvas relating to knowledge, understanding, values, attitudes, and skills. And these are the types of skills that we're talking about within that KUVAS framework. And what we found when we did our initial focus group research with schools, I think in all four countries, we found that where knowledge and understanding was very highly developed in school curricula in each country, and where schools very often had quite explicit values and attitudes, um, one thing which they didn't do explicitly in any of our countries was actually develop young people's skills, particularly the sort of broader soft skills and competencies that young people require to be more active citizens. Um, so we held a number of focus groups in the participating schools. And one of the things which young people told us in all four countries, I think, in the focus groups, was that, for example, um, they just didn't actually know and weren't taught how to, and to pick one example, how to find reliable information. And I can remember the focus group in London. It was at the time of the Ebola fever emergency in West Africa. And there were young people saying, well, we see this news on the internet about this terrible virus. Um, and a couple of young people asked us, are we going to die? Is this something which we should be frightened of? Because we just don't know how to sift the information and make, you know, and apply critical thinking to that question and actually reach a reliable answer. So this got us thinking about the sorts of skills that we wanted to tackle, uh, we, we decided we would work on sort of 15, and we decided how to prioritize them based on the results of those um, focus groups and the things that the young people were telling us. So maybe shall we click on the finding information one and just have a little look inside, since this is the one that we've just been talking about. and. Um, is this the best way? Yeah, this is the best way to scroll down. So we were talking about the internet, young people very often being told by their teachers in school for homework, oh, go and find on the internet 
X, Y, or Z. And the young people just not knowing <clears throat> what to trust and what to um, believe was reliable. And of course, subsequently, the latest, new, the latest word in our vocabulary is fake news. But we were doing this before um, that became the, um, the buzzword of, of the year. So we put together a guideline for how to actually do a proper Google, Google search. For example, a great many adults, and not just young people, don't know about how to use italics or the plus sign in a Google search and what that actually does to your search results. Um, a great many people don't know what the suffixes, the endings of websites actually indicate. And we also sort of suggested a number of tips to how to judge the reliability and usefulness of any um, website that you, you found. And then together with the skills pack, there's an exercise that participants, oops, that visitors to the site can take. Is this going to work? No. What am I? That an exercise that young people can do to actually examine websites critically. And we, we took the example of schools in India and put together a number of websites. And we asked young people to have a look at them and to actually sort of critically evaluate their usefulness for answering a question. So we're trying to set up a number of exercises through the skills section, which help to develop these broad, generic citizenship skills. Um, you know, if you cannot find reliable information from the internet, your capacity to be an advocate, to, to, to make a clear argument, to, to propose any sort of actions are going to be um, limited. And next we moved on to look at photographs and to actually interrogating um, and bring critical thinking skills to, to a photograph. And this is one of the Oxfam words and pictures, photographs which I cropped. Um, and then if Fede scrolls down a little bit more, you'll see the same young man standing in the same place, but you see more of the background and you realize possibly that he's not a, a sort of, you know, a, a youth standing in his front garden in somewhere comfortable in Europe, but is in fact, he, he's in a refugee camp in, in Lebanon. So, you know, how photographs are cropped, what exists outside the frame of a photograph and how you critically think about images that, you know, we see thousands of these images every day. Um, to, you know, the critical thinking applies to them as well. So that's one of the 15 skills modules. Are we going to ask people to pick another one to look at? Maybe go back to the menu and see which ones people are most interested in. And we can open up um, another one or two. So please type in the little text box. Um, have a little look through some of the skills yourself. If there's one you've heard of that sounds interesting, please type it in and we'll have a talk through it. Um, and feel free to come on off mute at this point if you'd like to share some feedback or any thoughts at this point. So this is a time to hear from you what you think about skills, um, what you've been finding of the website so far, um, and whether there's any other skills you'd like us to talk about. Leonella, I know you can't see the website. Sorry for that. So if there's anything that you'd like to suggest or share or ask us, also feel free to come in now too. Um, maybe while you choose the one that you would like to explore more, uh, we might tell you how we did come up with these 15, <laughs> 15 proposals. Um, so Erasmus Plus projects are 
foreseen a set of uh, partners meetings and uh, uh, learning exchanges and uh, yeah and through the partners meetings and the focus groups together um, we have been trying to assess from partner perspective and from teachers and young people perspective what would have been um, the main needs in terms of uh, transversal competencies for life. In this regards, we have been uh, setting up a list, brainstorming all together, and that somehow we have been trying to narrow because the, the list could have been, well, at the beginning was much longer than this. But we, um, we agreed that those proposals for skill development, skill development were functional for young people and uh, uh, schools to be able to, um, okay, working together, for young, young schools and young people to be able then to actively use and run the whole cycle of learn, think and act. So we uh, realized that there was a need to support the action parts in terms of competencies, both for teachers and uh, for young people. Okay, working as a team. So we, one of the things we heard through the focus groups is that young people primarily work individually in school. They sit at an individual desk and complete exercises. And that actually working together and cooperating um, as a group is a skill which needs to be practiced and developed. It's not something that we can assume that group work and teamwork will work effectively sort of automatically. So we started off by suggesting some ways in which young people could identify others who were um, who could participate with them in in, in a group um, in, in, in for example a voluntary extracurricular group where they were looking for allies amongst their peers who they could work with and then once they had identified possible participants we then suggested a number of ways in which, um, if I can just get the scroll, a number of ways in which they could actually um, warm up the session and get to know each other better and get to, you know, to quickly establish trust between, um, between one another. So you can see some of these activities like the handshake, the hot potato, the social contract, practicing persuasion, moving your boat. These sound like dance steps, <laughs> don't they? Um, These are uh, youth exchanging, yeah, non-formal uh, education, getting to know each other, other activities. Better, yeah. And we, we, we particularly, like, we think that these happen, that these are useful, um, both within new ways of working within the formal curriculum in school, but also Oxfam GB has a youth ambassador program of young people who meet in Oxfam groups in extracurricular time voluntarily after school and we've written um, these sort of skills development resources for those young people as well who are possibly meeting without outside um, supervision from teachers and who are meeting voluntarily outside the school day. Okay, thanks, John. Um, so, as we were saying, this uh, website offers a huge amount of materials and uh, moving somewhere else. Yes, we have five minutes, but being uh, half English and half Italian groups, we can get five minutes more, you know. <laughs> um, Moving to the oops, sorry. Moving towards the um, global citizenship education tab. 
as uh, John was explaining at the beginning, we have been making uh, um, short downloadable documents starting from Oxfam GB approach on global citizenship education. And then uh, um, we have been proposing also um, another downloadable document that tackles participatory learning methods, so the methods themselves brainstorming, work affair, uh, silent floor, um, a lot of uh, open space technology, all the methods that uh, trainers use when delivering uh, uh, non-formal education trainings with a global citizenship education approach. And then last but not least, as uh, we we have been working a lot also together with the Institute of Education of London, as uh, um, Nikki was mentioning at the beginning. So the Institute of Education, together with uh, us and throughout the, the outcomes of the focus groups, uh, came out with a youth outcome matrix that is used, that has been used over these three years in order to monitor, assess and evaluate the learning progress of young people. The nice part is that these tabs are not just a list of things, but you can click on any of them and you can open them. And like, for instance, I opened the knowledge of global social justice issues and uh, opening the page, you get to new kinds of resources that again are going to work on the specific transversal competencies that we have agreed together with uh, the Institute of Education to be monitored over the time. And very rapidly, again here, you get the same format for all those, uh, uh, I think there are nine uh, activities. Um, where there's a, a, a detailed description on how to run the, the activity. Like this is um, an activity that is used a lot also in uh, non-formal education trainings. So to let young people understand and physically position themselves according to uh, some kind of indicators in the space, in the room. So to move themselves according to the percentage of the world population move themselves according to the percentage of uh, um, other things that are listed below and try to make also some conclusions like um, to move the people before according to the, the number of the population and afterwards to let them move according to uh, the amount of uh, uh, wealth they have in uh, over the according to their gdp over the time and uh, after the activities, there's also um, a way to try to assess if young people have been developing those competencies and we have been identifying an early developing a secure stage to try to uh, evaluate if uh, young people uh, manage, you know, and uh, develop that specific competence. And here again, you get kind of different proposals of no formal education activities that they can, um, that teachers or trainers of uh, groups of young people can undertake all together. So, as I was saying, this is just one example. There's uh, nine of them that are also linked to the skills. Ah, unfortunately, I'm not using the mouse in this specific moment, as probably you can say, but that's the best part of being live. And alive I would say and um, I would like to give back the floor to John okay so Fede I've just realized how much stuff there is on this website it's always um, boggles my mind when I see how much that we've actually done and how much of it is online yeah so the project is, is, is now reaching its formal close. I believe the funding phase of it will end um, in the autumn of this year. And my vision of this, and what I always, how I always explain it, is that we have received, Oxfam and the partners have received a free gift. This is 
essentially the time that we've been given to work on this and the website and the materials that we've produced is a free gift. So what we're interested in exploring with you is what the life of this project and the materials look like after the, the formal phase ends. How do we share and implement these materials in more EU and countries in the global south? Um, what's its value to you? Because it's your free gift as well. Um, how do we disseminate um, beyond the networks that we're already establishing? And what else should we be doing in the final few months before the funding ends to actually really round it off and make it um, of, of maximum value for, for all of us? So we really want to throw that open to you. That's the main reason we wanted to show it to you. Um, we'd like you to explore it more, obviously, in your own time. It's an open access website. Um, but we are really interested in what we should be, you know, what we should do next with it and how it can be of value to as many people as possible um, within, um, within Oxfam. Thank you, John. And I just wanted to add as well, as, as part of the final dissemination of this project, we are running um, a round of different um, sort of conferences and events. So we call them multiplier events. So there'll be one happening in Poland, in the UK, in Cyprus and in Italy for our own national context where we're going to be disseminating and talking about this project in our, in our home cities and towns. But then we're also running an international event and I'm sure many of you have heard um, that we well heard of the Gene Network so for those who haven't that's the Global Education Network Europe um, network and every year sort of twice a year they run different annual conferences and the Institute of Education are part of, are part of the working group and are organizing the next international gene conference which will be held in London in May so we are running um, a sort of SF youth dissemination as part of that multiplier event and they're inviting policymakers and academics internationally from Europe and beyond to come and participate in that event. So it's over two days and um, there'll be lots of different presentations on global education generally, on different research tools and the focus is trying to get policymakers and academics together to try and think about how to take global learning, global education, global citizenship education forward in the context of the sustainable development goals and in the context of projects like Schools for Future Youth. So we'll be a very small part of that conference, but registration is open for that. And I'm happy to share the link to you all as well. Um, it's not just this project that's being talked about, but it's the whole context of um, global learning. So it might be something that's of interest to you and to your partners as well. So I'll certainly circulate that link afterwards. But Leonella, I don't think we've fully answered your question, but I think the plea is there really to have a look at these resources and think if they may work in your context. And I think most of you know me, Nikki, um, through the uh, sort of domestic affiliate group um, or through work, you'll know one of us anyway. So do send us any thoughts um, that you think of uh, once we've finished the webinar. We'd really like to hear from you. And I just wanted to share um, a few thoughts, really. John mentioned focus groups. We've done a lot of focus groups throughout this project. Um, and a lot of teachers have said, um, and I quote, young people have a real taste and enthusiasm, enthusiasm now for taking part in global campaigns and being part of Oxfam and a school's youth action group. So specifically referencing Oxfam because we're going in and providing them that support, but that was reflected across all of the countries. Um, and also there was a nice one from a teacher in Italy, which I can't find at the moment, but it was saying how um, a group of young people had gone out to take social action in the middle of the city and the young people got a lot of feedback from the citizens and actually how powerful that was for the young people to hear from local citizens that they were engaged in the issue, they were, they were doing a great job and they were really motivated. Mm. So I think hearing from young people for me has been a real 
bonus, we see actually these things do matter and they care. And our challenge is finding the right teachers, the right schools, the right youth workers to open up these spaces for young people to think more critically and go on to take action. So we hope that's given you a bit of a flavour for the massive resources that is Schools for Future Youth. Um, we hope you found that interesting and we really would welcome more feedback from you after this via email to any one of us. Yes, shall we put the video again? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just to say goodbye. <laughs> yes. We're putting our little video on so we can wave goodbye from Cyprus and say thank you very much. It's really nice to be speaking to colleagues around the world. <laughs> yeah, thank you for and we'll speak participating. To you all Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. You. Bye. <laughs> okay, shall we?